Exodus 20. I'm reading in the New International Version. This is God's infallible and inerrant word. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. Uh, welcome Cameron to come and speak to us, and he'll be speaking to us on the uh, Good Samaritan. And uh, Judy's going to bring that reading to us. It's from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Uh, That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed on by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was and, the, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the, an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave him to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these two do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the ha hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, 
Go and do likewise. Amen. I think we uh, we made up for any technical difficulties with the, the the amount of singing that was going on. It was really good. But as we as we begin, uh, let us pray and ask our Lord for His help. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, our Heavenly Father, uh, we as we come before Your Word, uh, we ask that You would uh, give us clarity of mind, uh, help us to focus, uh, to be. Uh, and we, we also ask, Lord, that you would give us your spirit of understanding, uh, that you would ready our hearts, uh, that we would be changed by all that you have to say to us through your scriptures. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, so this morning, uh, we are going to look at, we have the opportunity to uh, learn from one of Jesus' parables uh, that we find recorded in Luke's gospel. Uh, so in case you're wondering what a parable is, a parable is actually an illustrative story uh, that Jesus told as part of his teaching. Uh, they, they're not actually historical records in any way. They're illustrations. Uh, but we love the parables because they are so engaging and memorable, uh, yet they contain such deep truths uh, that uh, you can spend a lifetime examining them and considering all their various applications and still not reach the end of all that they have to say to us. And so this morning, we are going to begin with one of the most well-known parables of Jesus, uh, which has come to be known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, if you watch uh, the evening news for any period of time, uh, it is inevitable that you will hear the phrase, uh, the Good Samaritan being used uh, to describe a person who uh, either helps a stranger or who is engaged in any kind of charitable work. Now, I say this because it illustrates for us um, just how easy it is to read this section of Luke's gospel and come away with uh, some kind of superficial moral teaching about how you should be kind to strangers. Uh, and we, this is exactly what we see reflected in our society's use of the term Good Samaritan, isn't it? Or even worse, you, you could just as easily wrongly conclude that Jesus is teaching here that you can obtain eternal life uh, through your own good works, uh, which is actually heresy. And by heresy, I mean uh, an error that is so serious that if you hold to that belief, you won't actually have salvation. Now, so in other words, it is vitally important for us to understand what Jesus is teaching here. And so the, the context in which Jesus used this parable, uh, the context is key to understanding the point that the parable is intended to make. Uh, and in verse 25, we see that the context of this parable is a conversation between Jesus and a lawyer, uh, which is the name that Luke, uh, the name that he uses for a scribe or a person who is an expert in the scriptures and in particular in the law of God. And so we see here, if you look at verse 25, that this lawyer, he stands up and he asks Jesus a question which most likely indicates to us that Jesus was in the, in the process of, of teaching a large crowd of people that were gathered around him and seated on the ground. And we didn't read that this lawyer, he asked an interesting question. He says, Teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Now, on the surface, uh, this appears to be an admirable question. After all, isn't this the most important question of all? How can you have eternal life with God? Okay, it is vital for each one of us to be concerned uh, with the answer to that question. But is this actually the question that is being asked? Which brings us to the first point. Are you actually asking the right question? Now, unfortunately, this question, as is posed by the as posed by the lawyer, it's not actually as in, as innocent or as sincere as it may appear to be on the surface. Because if you look again at verse twenty five, it is noted that the lawyer he didn't ask this question because he was genuinely looking for an answer. He asked this question because he was trying to test Jesus. He most likely uh, wanted to show Jesus up in front of everyone who was present or even to trap him into saying something that would give his enemies an excuse to arrest him. We know that this is the case because there are multiple examples recorded throughout the Gospels of the Pharisees and scribes following Jesus around, hanging on his every single word, just so that they could find a way to have him put to death. 
because he de- dared to identify him as no- himself as none other than the very Son of God. So having said that, we see that the lawyer uh, asked Jesus this question in a very particular way. He doesn't come to Jesus and say, well, Jesus, I can see from your miracles that God is working through you in some way. So could you tell me, how can I obtain eternal life with God? Now, he doesn't say that. If he did, this would basically be the exact same conversation that the Pharisee Nicodemus had with Jesus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, he recognized that God was with, was with Jesus, and so he came to speak with him. And Jesus actually answered his question about eternal life before he even had a chance to ask it. But this is not what the lawyer does. He doesn't come humbly seeking answers. He thinks he already knows the answers. Rather, he comes with pride and self-assurance. He comes to test Jesus. And so he poses the question. He says, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Now, by phrasing the question as, what must I do? The lawyer, he shows that he believes that eternal life is actually earned through the doing of good works, such as through the obedience of the law. In other words, this was a guy who was certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could obtain personal righteousness and thus eternal life by himself personally keeping all of God's rules. And isn't this such a common attitude even today? It's possible that you might even think this way yourself. The Christianity is, is simply all about keeping a moral set of, uh, a set of moral rules or instructions and somehow proving to God that you are so, some way or another a good person. Because good people, they, they, they're the ones who get to go to heaven, right? Well, this is the attitude that this lawyer had. And Jesus, he recognizes this immediately. So, he, so for the sake of the argument, Jesus actually goes along with this lawyer's way of thinking. And so he doesn't actually give the lawyer the answer that he's expecting. Jesus, he actually just simply skips past the answer. And instead, Jesus asks the lawyer a question of his own. He says, what is written in the law and how do you read it? In essence, Jesus is saying to this man, he's saying, well, you want to be saved by the law? Well, what does the law demand of you? And so this lawyer, he responds in verse 27, if you see, with the answer. He says, Lord, uh, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's at this point I should clarify that the law that Jesus is referring to here is not actually the Ten, is not just the Ten Commandments. That we, that we read earlier this morning, uh, but rather it refers to the contents of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all of which were written by Moses. Now, together, these five books, they are called the Torah or the law. But the reason that we read from the Ten Commandments this morning is because they are, in essence, a summary of what those five books teach us about what God expects from the people that he has created, from you and from I, from me. Sorry, it was bad grammar. Uh, and so we see that the, the lawyer responds to Jesus' question by summarizing the law even further. Uh, he, recognizes, he actually recognizes that in essence the law uh, of God, it can be boiled down to this one thing, which is love. Love of God and love of neighbor. Now, you might actually notice this for yourself, yourself next time you read the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments, they actually address our attitude towards God. And the remaining six commandments, they address our attitude towards other people. And we can observe that the, this attitude should be one of love. And Jesus, he actually affirms this answer by stating, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, on the surface, it now appears that we have our answer. But this is where we have to be careful not to misinterpret what is being said here. 
Jesus is not saying that you and I can obtain eternal life if we just do our best to be good people. He is simply affirming something that is technically correct, that if you obey God's law perfectly, if you never even break it once, then you are righteous and you'll have eternal life with God. He's not for a moment actually suggesting that it would be possible for this lawyer or for anyone else for that matter to actually do this. And, and later, Jesus would actually say this uh, explicitly in Luke chapter 18 when a young and wealthy ruler came to him and began, began a conversation just like this one by saying, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? To which Jesus responds, he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. Now, although there is, although there is an amazing irony here uh, in Jesus' words, in the fact that he is actually none other than God himself, what Jesus is saying here is true. No one apart from God is without sin. Every single person breaks God's law. But it would, it would appear that the lawyer, he actually senses this implication from Jesus. And so we read in verse 29 that in an attempt to justify himself, he asked Jesus, well, who then is my neighbor? He had just stated to Jesus that the law could be summed up as loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And now he apparently wants to prove to Jesus and to all of those watching that he has actually been able to fulfill the law by loving those around him. Now, the word, the Greek word translated here as neighbor, it describes someone who lives nearby. But it can also describe someone who lives in a, who belongs to a kind of an in-group, uh, which could be either cultural or racial. And this is this is certainly how this lawyer understood this term neighbor, uh, which led him to believe that he was actually doing pretty well when it came to obeying God's law. He could say, I love my wife, I love my family, I love my friends, I love the nation of Israel. These are my neighbours. I have kept God's law. I am good enough to go to heaven. But this now introduces our second point. Are you good enough? It's at this point that Jesus responds, but this time not with a comment or a statement, but he responds with a story, with a parable. And this is how he begins. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, they beat him, and they went and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, the area that Jesus set this parable in, it would have been very well known to to those listening uh, due to this journey's notorious danger. So in order to travel the 27 kilometers from Jerusalem to Jericho, travelers had to pass uh, had to travel through what was known as the Pass of Adumim, uh, which basically translates as the Pass of Blood. Now, it had this name because uh, this was an area that was made up of steep rocky cliffs that were filled with caves, which gave excellent cover for ro- uh, for robbers and bandits. And this area, it was actually so infamous that even 400 years after Jesus' time, it was still recorded as being infested with thieves and muggers. And so Jesus, he describes to the lawyer and to all those who were gathered around him the plight of this unfortunate and presumably Jewish man uh, who was left robbed and left half dead beside the road. Now, as I mentioned, this wouldn't, have, this wouldn't have been an unknown occurrence in these parts. But Jesus carries on to describe that just as it so happened, a priest was actually traveling down that very same road, and he came upon the scene. But instead of helping this poor guy, he, he decides to not get involved, and he just walks on past. And so Jesus again describes another man, this time a Levite, who was... A Levite's essentially like uh, someone who assists in the temple in Jerusalem. And he too, he, he fails to help and simply walks on by. Now, some people have argued that the priest and the Levite, that they were afraid to touch this man because if it turned out that he actually was dead, 
uh, then they would have become ceremonially unclean and unable to fulfill their, uh, for a time, uh, fulfill their duties in the temple. But this is actually reading way too far into things because the, the point that is being made here is quite simple. It's, it's that if anybody could have been expected to help this, to help a fellow Jew uphold the, God's law, uh, it would have presumably been the most religious men in society. But instead, they just walked on by. Now, this, this is the equivalent of, just, of, of Tony here seeing one of, one, a member of this congregation just laid out on the road, uh, bleeding out, and just saying to him, sorry, mate, I've got somewhere to be, and just walking on by. But Jesus then begins to describe something even more shocking than this. He introduces a third man, and this time, this man, he's not a Jew, he's actually a Samaritan. Now, the Samaritans, they lived up in the north of Israel, and they originated from Jews who had intermarried with, Assyri- with the Assyrians who had conquered Israel's northern kingdom a few hundred years before. And as a result, the, they were viewed as traitors, and they were despised by the Jewish people in, who lived in the south. Now, to illustrate just how much the Jews of Jesus' day, uh, they resented the, their Samaritan cousins, when the Jews travelled north, they would quite often take an extra long, long route just so they wouldn't have to pass through Samaritan towns and bump into these people. But then in a way that would be inconceivable to those who are listening, Jesus, he then describes this Samaritan man actually taking pity on this injured Jewish traveller. If you look there at verse 34, we read, He bandages his wounds. He cleans and disinfects them with wine. He soothes them with oil. He lifts the man up onto his own donkey and he leads him all the way to an inn where he stays with him an entire night caring for him. And finally, he pays the innkeeper two months' rent in advance to make sure that he is looked after. And then he promises to pay any outstanding debts upon his return. Now, there's a great Greek word used here to describe the way that the, he actually pays the innkeeper, and that word is ek bello, which means to, to cast out or to throw something. Now, this word, by using this word, Jesus doesn't just describe this guy as just like reluctantly placing a few coins in the hand of the innkeeper. He's, he actually basically just throws the money at him. He, he's explaining here that there's an, there's a, he's describing an extravagant generosity. There is no expense spared. Nothing is too inconvenient. For instance, the Samaritan, he would have had to tear his own garments to make the bandages that the injured man needed. He used up his own wine and oil to treat the the wounds, which are probably part of his food for his own journey. He then put this man on his own donkey, uh, which would have meant that he would have had to walk on foot for the remainder of the journey. And then he spent an entire night caring for this man in an inn which could have meant actually missing important engagements. And finally, he basically just hands over his credit card to make sure that this injured man has everything that he needs. This is an astounding level of love to show anyone. Uh, Let alone, but what is more amazing is that this love, it's not directed towards a friend or a family member, but this love, it's actually directed towards an enemy. And it's at this point that Jesus, he then turns to the lawyer and he says, well, which of these three do you think uh, was a neighbour to the man who fell in with robbers? And at this point, the the lawyer, he obviously recognises the answer, but we see that his resentment of the Samaritan uh, runs so deep that he can't even bring himself to mention the Samaritan by name. Instead, he just says through gritted teeth, the one who had mercy on him. In speaking this parable, Jesus has just stripped away all of this man's pride and laid bare his hypocrisy. Even by his own assessment of God's law, the lawyer, he could now see that he didn't measure up. He didn't love others the way that this Samaritan did. Even he, he could see that even he was not good enough. He 
And what Jesus had just done was to show this man that the law, it doesn't, pr- uh, it doesn't prove to God how good you are. It actually does the exact opposite. The law actually acts as a mirror that is held up to show you just how unlike God you are in your attitudes and in your actions. And this is exactly what is explained in Romans chapter 3, which says, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And this brings us to our final point. Well, who is good enough? Well, it might, for, it might therefore seem puzzling that after all that has just been said, we read that Jesus responds to this lawyer at the end of verse 27 by saying, well, go now and do likewise. Well, doesn't this just contradict everything that Jesus has just said prior? Is Jesus now saying that although the lawyer wasn't good enough, if, if he can just be like the Samaritan, then, then he will have eternal life? Well, obviously this isn't the case. And this is why, again, we have to be so careful to never read the Bible in a casual or superficial way. So what does Jesus actually mean here? Well, although we find ourselves unable to love even the, the, those closest to us to the extent that this parable describes, let alone loving strangers or even our enemies, the standard of perfect love that God's law requires still applies to us. Every single one of us has been created in God's image, and therefore we have a responsibility to reflect our Creator's character in every aspect of our lives. And so when we fail to do this, we actually break God's law. But then comes the obvious question. If every single one of us falls short of what the law requires, well, who then is actually good enough? How can anyone actually obtain eternal life? Well, this is the good news of the gospel. And Jesus isn't demanding anything from this lawyer or from you or I that he is not willing to do himself. In fact, the love that Jesus demonstrated in his own earthly life far exceeded anything that this Samaritan ever did in the story. The Samaritan, he tore his clothes to bandage the man's wounds, whereas Jesus, he tore his own body upon the cross to cover our sins. The Samaritan, he he poured out wine to cleanse any infection, but Jesus, he poured out his own blood to wash away our transgressions. The Samaritan, he lifted up this man upon a donkey and carried him down the road. But Jesus, he lifts us up out of the grave and carries us into God's very presence. The Samaritan, he rented a bed and stayed a single night. But Jesus, he prepares a room for us in his father's house and promises to be with us forever. Now Romans 5 says, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God, he shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now the Bible is clear. You are not good enough to go to heaven. I am not good enough to go to heaven. But God so loved us that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The lawyer, he was correct when he said that we must love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength and all of our mind and love our neighbour as ourself. But he failed to recognise that we should seek to do this actually out of gratitude to God rather than as a way of proving our own personal righteousness. Only Jesus is good enough to dwell in God's holy presence. But because of the extravagantly generous love that he has shown to us by paying the debt that our sin owed to his Father, we too can share in his eternal inheritance in heaven by repenting of our sin 
and trusting in him alone for our eternal life. So let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise and we glorify you for all that this passage has to teach us, for the the vivid reminder that uh, we are incapable of meeting the standard of righteousness that your law requires. Uh, But we also praise you that in your perfect love, you have provided for us another way that we might obtain eternal life with you, Uh, not through anything that we can do, but through the sinless life, the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would apply your word to our hearts this morning, uh, that you would guard us from any temptation to think that we can be righteous in our own strength alone. And so uh, we ask that you would grant us a humble dependence upon the one who is righteous, the one who has already paid the debt that our sin requires, uh, so that we might share in the eternal life that he has earned for us. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.